future science. Obviously, the electric universe is a paradigm shift of unparalleled magnitude. And consequently, future science is unlikely to look very much like anything that we witness today. So the boundary rider of science is about to take you to the limits of my uh, boundaries. <laughs> So I showed you this the other day, but just a, a very quick whip through these uh, principles that apply to the electric universe. First of all, we return to classical physics, cause and effect, no creation of matter from nothing, no annihilation of matter, all of these things are meaningless, and also reinstate <coughs> classical electrodynamics, the electrical connection between all matter in the universe, the instant connection. No disciplinary boundaries. There is no taboos in the electric universe. So you can come up with anything you like and ask questions about it, and it should be addressed rationally. Simplify. Well, I think I've simplified it down to a single force now. <laughs> I think that's a first. And also reintroduce history because history is fascinating and you realise the mistakes we've made with uh, looking back in hindsight and we must do that and I think in doing so it is also inspirational because you find that great minds in the past have been here before but somehow the message got lost. This is important and I think we've seen that in this breadth of the uh, presentations we've seen. Cosmology must illuminate all of our existence, our connection to the earth. We are earthlings after all. And we must take that into account when we talk about maybe we'll colonize Mars or the moon. Does that mean we'll be Martians if we start populating Mars? I have a good idea that that's probably true. But this is never considered, of course, with current thinking. And the result must be coherent. The bits of the puzzle must fit neatly. And also, and this is important, anyone can help fill in this puzzle because it's an enormous task. And I realised this very early on. That's why I share my ideas, even at the risk of being wrong, because the only way to advance is to have the courage to say that I was wrong. Uh, before I talked about the hugest scale, you know, the largest scale galaxies and uh, stars. Now we're drilling down in the opposite direction and there's no known way of determining just how far down you have to go before you get to what is the origin of matter. But it, interestingly enough, in the process of figuring out how gravity works, it gives some possible clues to what goes on at the lower levels. This is an attempt to give an idea of the scale of the atom because we've seen all of these pictures of atoms with a central nucleus and then the electrons buzzing around a few inches away. Well, on this scale, the nucleus would be the size of a ping pong ball inside this 100,000 seat stadium, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, which quite a few of you cricket tragics might, uh, <laughs> might recognise. The electrons in this atom would be the size of fleas or smaller orbiting outside this stadium. The atom is mostly space, but it's not empty, of course, because there is an ether which permeates everything. It is the ether which transfers the electric force from charged particles to other charged particles within the atom and beyond. And I've supported Edwin Kyle in his research because I realised that this model where you have two particles, now we've seen the standard model with umpteen different so-called uh, fundamental particles, you only need three actually, the proton, the electron and the ether particle, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. And the neutral matter that we exist in on the Earth is all made up of these charged particles. 
proton and the electron in equal numbers. There are no neutrons in the, a stable atom. They are a means that nature uses to both introduce more charged particles to a nucleus to have low energy nuclear reactions and also for a neutron to leave an atom to change the number of, reduce the number of nucleons in an atom. It's essential in creating, uh, not creating, but generating all of the elements that we see. So that's important. All particles in the electric universe are real with real locations in space. They're not smeared out and statistically uh, either there or not there. Electrons in the nucleus occupy the space between the protons, as Edwin showed, and so the attractive force outweighs the repulsive force between the protons. But that does mean that the nucleus has structure, a sort of crystalline type of structure. So I've said that. And this uh, structure is resonant. In other words, the energy transferred between all of the particles in that nucleus and throughout the atom, in, including the uh, external electrons, must be able to both send and receive energy so that over an orbit it sums to zero. Otherwise, it's not a stable system. But uh, of course, the good thing about this is, in terms of simplification, we now no longer need a strong force in the nucleus. So all we need is the electron, the proton, and the electric force to build all the elements. Quantum behavior. So what is quantum behavior? It has to do with this resonance structure, the fact of transferring energy amongst a number of particles in motion such that over a short interval, the sum of all that energy transfer is zero. Anyway, here we get to electrodynamics and the equation of the electric force, Coulomb's law, like Newton's law of gravity, doesn't refer to time, so it's instantaneous. And you can see here the positive charges repel, positive and negative uh, attract, so there's the possibility of a balanced force. And also note in this force law down here, that little k is known as the dielectric constant vacuum of the vacuum. Well, it's not a vacuum, it's the di dielectric constant of the ether, which means that the particles that fill the universe have structure. They must have structure to be able to sustain an electric dipole, which is what dielectric means. The standard model of the atom cannot understand how an electron doesn't just spiral into the nucleus because normally an accelerated particle radiates energy, loses energy, and in losing energy the orbit will decay and spiral into the nucleus. Quantum mechanics merely says it's just a recipe book. It says it doesn't do that because it doesn't do it. And and they've devised a mathematical system which, show, which actually matches the orbits. But just in having a, an explanation or a description doesn't give you an explanation. There's a description only. I've said that requires lossless resonant exchange of energy between protons and electrons, otherwise the electron spirals into the nucleus. As soon as you introduce the instantaneous electric force, you don't have this problem. But this requires, once again, substructure of the proton and the electron. And the simplest symmetrical, that is three-dimensionally symmetrical substructure is that of the atom. And as I said in my earlier presentation, this works from the bottom up. You work from a successful model, which has been tested in all sorts of ways and has been shown to be a good model and use that model when you go down a step and you're trying to uh, figure out what's happening at a level that cannot be, at this stage, investigated. Here we go. This is the guy who I consider to be a pioneer of the electric universe atom, Wilhelm Eduard Weber. And in the middle of the 19th century, uh, he produced a planetary model of the atom. 
So he was the pioneer, and here we are so much later, still floundering with multiple particles and strange forces which are transmitted by imaginary particles and so on. Other scientists of the 19th century accepted the existence of a continuous substance filling all space, the ether. They were looking for an equation describing the flow of this continuous substance through space, utilising concepts like fields, lines of force, vortexes, etc. And this is the way we've gone. The positive particle is long-range attractive and short-range repulsive in uh, Weber's model. Let's get that. So during his scientific career, he presented a particle or atomistic conception of nature. In other words, what I said before, these are real particles uh, occupying real positions in space. And it includes the ether. He was convinced of the existence of discrete elementary particles. At the end of his life, he tried to derive physical phenomena based only on the existence of positive and negative charged particles. And you'll notice here, and I've underlined it, of different masses. This is your electron and your proton. And this is before the atomic structure was even guessed at by uh, other scientists. And they're interacting with one another according to his universal law of electrical attraction of 1846. That universal law is quite remarkable because he showed that a positive and a negative particle, as they draw closer together, the one particle will go into orbit around the other. And below a certain radius, the force between them, instead of being attractive between opposite charges, becomes repulsive. And there are stable orbits within that region. That was the model of the atom. And this is what we observe to actually happen. This book is a new one. Uh, Andre Assis, the top guy there, uh, I've communicated with him over the years uh, because I consider him to be a leading uh, real scientist. He's a scholar. And he told me this book was about to be published. And as soon as it was, I bought it. And uh, I'm still reading it. But I've been underlining sections of it like crazy because this fellow was there before me. Of course, what happened historically? Faraday and Maxwell rejected the material conception of electricity and denied the existence of electric atoms. This is the kind of hurdle you have to overcome. Faraday himself said he didn't understand this idea, which is a surprise, really, when you think about it, because he was the man who was uh, figuring out how electric motors work and so on. But Weber was a very careful researcher, an experimentalist, and he determined some of the uh, constants uh, associated with uh, magnetism. And his name still appears in terms of magnetism. So the electric universe model is this one where the electron has internal structure, and the same with the proton. Now, at the time when I put this slide together, I, I just couldn't be bothered trying to figure out how to mess with this to turn it into all protons and electrons. So I've just said electron proton pair referring to these objects. And you can uh, consider the, the red balls, of course, as being positive, the protons. But they, these two objects have structure. They're stable resonant orbital structures of smaller charged particles. And the positron and the antiproton are mirror particles. There's no such thing as antimatter. There's no creation or annihilation, but it requires an ether. The reason for that is that we know that you can get what's called pair production. And that is that you can have an electron and a positron. They form at the same time in the presence, usually, of a catalytic uh, atom, something of, usually of a heavy element. Once again, it's all about resonant interactions. Uh, so the electron has a mirror particle produced, which means that the ether particle must contain all of the subcomponents, all of these bits plus all of its mirror particle, combined into a very compact form, more like a nucleus than a, uh, an atom. And that would explain uh, the kind of particle we're looking for to suggest as the ether. 
Once again, the electric force must operate instantly, otherwise these particles in here are moving far faster than the speed of light. Uh, a friend of mine who put me onto this idea of structure of the electron way back in, what is it, 1981, uh, said that, or calculated that the particles orbiting within the size of the classical radius of an electron must be moving so fast that if you could release one of these subparticles, it could go from here to the other side of the Andromeda galaxy in one second. <laughs> and of course, this simple model gives you 254 stable resonant nucleides plus another 85 metastable ra or radioactive nucleides for a total of 339. When those nuclei combine with the requisite number of negative electrons to form atoms and molecules, the possibilities are boundless in the living world, as we observe. So these are some definitions of the electric universe. It's a connected, coherent entity. It obeys Marx's principle of the impact of all of the matter in the rest of the universe on the local matter here. There is a polarizable material ether which fills the universe and connects all matter instantly by the electric force because they form a daisy chain like a chain of magnets on a slippery surface. You shake the surface and all the magnets will join north, south, north, south, north, south. So you end up with a force at one end of the, uh, this ch daisy chain being instantly transferred to the other end. It's a longitudinal force. Light on the other hand is transverse so it's like waving a rope and you take some time for the disturbance to get to the other end of the rope. That is the speed of light, which is very slow. The ether must be, to uh, answer to Maxwell's requirements and so on, a perfect fluid of neutral particles which pass through atoms and celestial bodies practically as if they weren't there, because they have to connect all matter, it doesn't matter where it is, inside the a body of a planet or a star or, an empty, or, or out in deep space. And the particle that fills, fits this description is the neutrino. And for a long while, uh, scientists were suggesting the neutrino had no mass. In fact, when I was at university, it was called disembodied spin. Can you imagine that? <laughs> totally meaningless. They must have mass if they are a material particle because mass is defined in the electric universe with a bit of luck, or oh, we've got energy first. Energy is defined as matter in motion relative to the matter in the rest of the universe. So all subatomic particles have internal structure like an atom, uh, and that is the energy that's contained within them. And I define mass as a measure of the distortion. Because this is a system of particles in motion, if you give it a poke with an electric force, which, I mean, poking something, it's all transferred electrically, that tiny particle will distort. And when it distorts, uh, it's like a, a satellite in orbit. If you give it an acceleration on one side of the orbit and you decelerate it on the other, the result is it becomes an elliptical orbit with the nucleus at one focus. In other words, that particle becomes a tiny transverse dipole. But at the same time, in the process of distorting, it's adding energy to that object because it's pulling the particles apart. And the mass of an object uh, appears to be due to the fact that some heavy atoms are much more difficult to distort than others. OK, light. Is light a wave or a particle? If a wave, what's waving? Einstein did away with James Clark Maxwell's essential medium. Or is light a particle, a photon? It can't be both a wave and a particle. Or you know, just choose at your whim whether you treat it as one or the other. You'll notice this diagram, which I took off the web, trying to describe light. And it uses these terms, wave-like and particle-like. It's totally meaningless, physically meaningless. If it's a particle, according to Einstein, to travel at the speed of light, it would shorten in length to the point of being two-dimensional. There is no physical object that occupies two dimensions, so suddenly you've lost your photon. 
The other thing is that to, um, as I said, and also to get to the speed of light, according to the physicists, you need infinite energy to accelerate something to the point of having uh, the speed of light. So to get over that, the physicist said, well, the photon has zero mass, but if it has zero mass, it has zero energy. So it's, it doesn't make any physical sense whatsoever. So this means that if it's a wave, it's a disturbance in the ether. It's an electrical disturbance which is transmitted through the ether. And because it's transverse, all of the little neutrinos with their little dipoles have to rotate through 360 degrees for every cycle. And it's the moment of inertia of a neutrino which gives, determines the speed of light and also the density of neutrinos because we know that if light passes from a less dense medium to a more dense, the light slows down. It's got more inertia in those particles that it's trying to affect. So there's no gravitational lensing. But what you do get in any atmosphere is refraction. So it's normal refraction. And of course, this means we don't understand light while we depend on it to observe the universe. So this is a real fundamental problem. Light's a transverse electrical disturbance uh, in a dielectric medium, the ether, simple. The wave carries energy through the medium and as far as I can imagine, the energy is absorbed incrementally. In other words, an electron and a proton does not have a fixed, a standard physical constant mass. They can accept energy in the form of uh, slight distortion uh, and uh, an electron can do that in its orbit until such time as its mass is such that to achieve stability it jumps to the next resonant state the next highest orbit. This has profound implications for the notion of redshift and therefore cosmology because redshift is the, the gold standard for determining the distance of objects. It gives the appearance that a photon has traveled between the sender and the receiver, but that is not the fact. Magnetism and gravity. As I said, only a single force is necessary to explain both magnetism and gravity. Now, there's two forms uh, I showed before, the attraction of between unlike charges, the repulsion of like charges, and uh, the other form of the force is the electric dipole. And the electric dipole is shown there because two charged particles cannot occupy the same space. So when they come close together, the electric field around them is different to what you get from just the uh, naked single charge. And this is important. I should also point out here the uh, power of the electric force. One second's worth of charge from a 120 watt light bulb uh, charging a one meter square plate one meter apart. We've got two plates there. One's got uh, a one coulomb of charge, negative charge, the other one's got the same, one neg uh, coulomb of negative charge. The repulsive force between those two one metre square plates is one million tonnes. So it gives you an impression of the power of the electric force. Two forms of the uh, electric force, electrostatic and dipole. Both forms occur in and between atoms, which is responsible for physical and nuclear chemistry. And uh, Edwin Carl, of course, has shown a model which gives us the opportunity to consider chemistry at the nuclear level using catalysts and so on. This is one of the ideas that uh, I spoke to uh, Monty about when we were um, talking about setting up the SAFIRE project, because I wanted to try to see if we could do nuclear chemistry because obviously the heavy elements must be generated somewhere and the notion that they're formed in explosions out in deep space which then dissipates all this material seemed to me to be the most useless way of producing them. If all stars produce the heavy elements in their photospheres, 
it provides a very simple answer to why we see the heavy elements in the spectrum of the sun and other stars, of course. OK, magnetism, uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, with an electric field operating uh, downwards this way, the electron nucleus is shifted to one focus of this ellipse. Because here, the uh, electron, uh, the orbiting particle here is accelerated this way and is decelerated because of working against the field coming back this way. And the result is it's moving fast here and slow there, which gives us this elliptical orbit with the electron nucleus this side. That means this end becomes more positive, this end becomes negative, this is an electric dipole. That transverse dipole is what we call the magnetic force. And it's why you cannot have a magnetic monopole, because this is the origin of it inside uh, an electron or a proton that's being accelerated. The objects have to be free to move to do this, by the way, because if they're trapped in a crystalline structure or a solid or even a liquid and they cannot uh, move out of the way, this is the effect you get. Now, remember when I said uh, stars and planets are formed by powerful electromagnetic forces? Once all of that material is assembled, the gravitational force is uh, set up. And in that case, remember the nucleus, the particles in the nucleus, the protons, and, uh, are much heavier, 2,000 2, times roughly, the weight of the, or the mass of the electrons that are orbiting. So in, in the uh, case of gravity, because you can't shield gravity, the nucleus is drawn down towards the centre of mass of the object. In the case of a planet, the centre of the planet. This means that this forms a dipole as well, with the negative pole facing this way and the positive po pole facing towards the centre of mass. Now, this... Uh, this force is very weak simply because you're talking about the electrons and the protons individually. And remember, the electric force is so powerful that the distortion is unmeasurable. It's very tiny. OK, I th think I've said all this here. <clears throat> but what does this mean? This means that for uh, celestial objects, and that includes stars and planets and moons and everything, comets, the outer uh, surface of these objects are negative gravitational poles. The moon has negative gravitational poles. And the interior has a uh, positive repulsive force within. So does the moon. All, all material objects out there in space have the same. It's only when you get within the uh, sphere of influence, they call it, of the gravitational field of the Earth that an object within that uh, region will have their subatomic dipoles oriented towards that of the Earth, and so they are then attracted because their positive pole is facing downwards towards the centre of this object. That's what we experience. We're like a whole lot of iron filings on uh, being drawn towards a magnet, and we don't care whether the magnet is the north or the south pole. We'll be you know, attracted to which is nearest. So the important thing is because the question for me uh, from uh, critics was uh, how, how do you set this up and you know, you're using the gravitational force to explain the gravitational force? Yeah, that's only if you assume that this is originally set up using gravity. But uh, celestial bodies' gravity is established at its birth. And uh, once again, this is stating one of the principles. This is the origin of mass, and also it explains this quantum spooky connection, as they call it. Because, as I said, physics is restricted to the speed of light for this connection between matter, these things should be disconnected if uh, you know, particles at kilometres distance cannot communicate instantly, despite the fact that experiments show that they do. So it's called spooky. This is a scientific word. Simultaneity means that classical universal time and three-dimensional space are reinstated. We go back to the classical view. 
Okay, this has significance for this guy. Uh, I really love his demonstrations, they're brilliant. Um, Professor Eric Laithwaite, as it says, he was a British electrical engineer and presenter of the 1974 Christmas lectures and he sparked a controversial debate with un his unconventional views on the behaviour of gyros. In other words, he showed what they did, but the experts couldn't explain it. Uh, I've got a note here, it says, um, yeah, the experts say, uh, wrote that he came to a series of false conclusions on gyroscopic motion, despite the fact that it was plainly in view of everyone. As a result, the proceedings of this lecture were never published. And it's only last year or so that uh, it was finally put up uh, and be made available. So this is it. This is one of the most interesting ones. We got sound? Put it down. I'll balance that, first of all, like a seesaw. So there is a balance point. When I take this out here, of course, then the balance point is uh, upset, it should dip down. We know that given the opportunity, it's going to do this if it can, but now we've balanced it, and we've balanced it about its centre of mass. So that if this gyro transfers its mass centre to the pivot, it should stay balanced. The question is, will it? <laughs> What's going on here? In this case with the gyro, of course, we're spinning this very fast so that all of the heavy nuclei in the atoms are being pushed preferentially to the outer rim, which means that their dipoles have been misplaced from where they were before, where they're facing downwards to the centre of the Earth. And you'll notice that they're positive. Now remember I said that all of the uh, celestial objects in the sky have their negative poles facing outwards, including the Earth. So because there is a difference in the geometry of the Earth's pull on this gyro to that of the rest of the universe, the gyro will if it's free to move in a horizontal circle, act like the water in Newton's bucket. And that is, it will rise up. You know, you spin a bucket of water and the water rises up at the sides. That's exactly what the gyro is doing. Of course, in the bucket of water, the same thing applies. The uh, molecules of water or the atoms uh, that make up the water, the nuclei, heavy nuclei, are being forced towards the outer rim of the bucket, which offsets their internal dipole. Now, of course, there's mathematics to describe the behaviour of a gyro, but it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't explain what's really going on. And, of course, once you have this lock-on to all the matter in the rest of the universe, you have an inertial guidance system. And that's what gyros are used for. They lock on to the fixed stars. That's how they do it. That's the positive gyro poles face outward towards the rest of the universe, which is negatively polarised and attractive instead of repulsive. The strong gravitational attraction locks the gyro to the fixed stars, essential for inertial navigation, and when the gyro pivots horizontally, it behaves like the water in Newton's bucket. This has significance. All of these things have significance for intrinsic redshift. Helton Art found high redshift quasars. It's probably a bit difficult to see. It's right there. And it's in front of this galaxy, low redshift galaxy behind, and a high redshift quasar in front of it. That should be 60 or 70 times behind that galaxy, the distance of that uh, foreground galaxy. 
The fact that it isn't says that the redshift is largely intrinsic to the object. It has nothing to do with its distance or its speed away from us. And Helton Arp did the observational work. He was a quintessential observational astronomer. He produced the uh, Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. So he was looking closely at galaxies and their structure and so on. And he came to the conclusion that quasars seem to have a strange affinity for active galaxies. They're ones that the nucleus is shooting material out along the axis. And he found that uh, he could find a high redshift quasar out along the axis here somewhere. And he knew that he could then predict that there would be another one with the same redshift, the same distance to the other side. In other words, it shoots the quasars out in pairs. And sure enough, it worked. And Helton Arp and the uh, Burbages, Jeffrey and Margaret, Margaret, the astronomers, all supported him in this work because this means that the Big Bang never happened. These high redshifted objects and faint objects are not at the ends of the universe. They are nearby. They are born, faint, highly redshifted, and over time they gain in mass, brightness, and their redshift drops back to normal. And eventually, get the next one, high redshift quasar, the redshift is dropping from 2 down to 1, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, and then it turns around because the mass is still increasing, 0.061. It's beginning to form spirals and it drops back and becomes a companion of its parent. The other side gives some other options. You can have a, uh, a child which is uh, highly active and which can actually start producing multiple galaxies down here. So you end up with a genealogy. It's almost a biological overtone to cosmology where you can, you can actually pick the parent in a group of galaxies. And uh, it means also that the Andromeda galaxy with its blue shift is not coming towards us. It just means that it's older than us. It may be our parent, who knows? <laughs> now, one of the other, this is where history gets mangled. Edwin Hubble said that this idea that the redshift meant the speed of the object and its distance he felt that was the least likely explanation. And right to his deathbed, he, he felt that uh, there was something wrong with physics. There certainly was. But of course, that, they, <laughs> they named the Hubble telescope after him and then go looking for these distant objects. There's a, sort of, there's a certain irony in all of that. The other thing is that uh, these uh, redshifts, he, never, he found certain values that re repeated for different uh, setups, different parents and different uh, children, but they had the same values and they were in steps. You never saw an intermediate value between one and the next. And he realised that this meant that the redshift is quantised. So the answer to uh, the redshift has is, is got nothing to do with the material medium between us and the quasar. So the idea of the wolf redshift uh, due to plasma between us and the object uh, is not the answer because it means that the electrons and the protons in this quasar are less massive than those in the uh, parent and in our galaxy. So the masses of the electron and the proton are quantized which is what you'd expect. It's a structured object. And uh, under different uh, electrical stresses, it will exhibit different resonant states. This changes the picture entirely. And this guy, uh, one of his books, has his idea of what cosmology is all about. And I realized that I had to answer all of the things that he raised, the issues that he raised, including repulsive gravity. So that was a, a big you know, prod to get gravity right. <laughs> Jim Ryder, once again, uh, this was the last address he gave to the Lucis Trust in New York uh, on April the 28th, only shortly before his uh, sad departure from uh, our physical realm. And uh, he showed this slide there because this, he was talking about gravity. Isn't it an aspect of electromagnetism? 
actually it's not electromagnetism, it's elec uh, the electrical force only. And these are the two theories he put forward. There was mine, um, wh where he just goes through the arguments here. And then there was this one by uh, Dr. Hal Puthoff, uh, who's a well-respected physicist. And uh, I spoke to Hal because he was uh, at the meeting in May uh, when we were all together. And uh, he had come to the same kinds of conclusions. An electrical model underlies gravity. Uh, the vacuum is an electrically polarizable medium, which is uh, the electric universe model. But he said, uh, for example, a virtual electron and positron plasma. Well, it's not. Uh, and there are no such things as virtual particles. However, the mathematics can still describe, uh, you know, still get the correct answers, even if the underlying uh, physics isn't understood. And he found that he could reproduce the four standard so-called weak field tests of general relativity. That's your bowling ball and your feather falling uh, precisely to 10 decimal places. So this model has been tested mathematically and it works to 10 decimal places. Everything electrical, even gravity, was his question. Gravity repels, and this is where I come to this uh, idea that Heltenart realised that to have a balanced universe without it all collapsing under gravity, gravity had to be repulsive instead to hold things in stasis, balance. So his uh, discoveries about quasi-intrinsic redshift and the non-expanding universe led to his abandoning pulling gravity and investigating pushing gravity. And he considered the fatio lesage uh, repulsive gravity hypothesis. There was a strange relationship between Newton and this guy. Uh, it's quite odd, but uh, this one here, Fatio, Nicholas Fatio de Duye, uh, had put forward an idea that gravity was actually uh, a repulsive force and the attraction between two bodies is because they're shielded from all the pushing from behind. So they tend to be pulled together or pushed together. For many years I never questioned the obvious fact that masses attracted each other. The attraction was so blatant that it required no thought. And that's, that's certainly the case. This is Halton Arp speaking. It's interesting how the crumbling of one fundamental assumption can have reverberations throughout the whole underpinning of science. And this is certainly the, the case. And the electric universe is out there hacking away. <laughs> so gravitational polarization. Cool matter is coalesced by electromagnetic forces to form a solid body and induce electrogravitation, I call it. Gravity is dipolar. I've said all that. And because you've got this spherical body with the negative poles facing outwards, it looks like a charged particle. And that's very interesting. And of course, under this circumstance, collisions are avoided in the universe. If it was a uh, conscious universe, you would expect that it would have this, these kinds of mechanisms. It's not about um, boys' toys, explosions, and things smashing together. It's about balance. Newton's attractive force has a limited sphere of influence. And externally, electrogravity is short-range attractive and long-range repulsive. Repeating myself there, I'm sorry. And internally, the gravitational force is repulsive. So black holes and neutron stars don't exist because when you start uh, piling matter together, it reaches a point where it doesn't like it anymore. It'll, it'll blow it apart. So I was very interested to come across this book, A Hollow Planet by Jan Lamprecht, a South African uh, computer uh, IT expert. And he uh, looked at the historical ideas about hollow planets, and most of them referred to a hole at the poles. Well, forget that. But there are all sorts of fanciful theories about what was inside the Earth. And of course, all models of the Earth's interior assumes Newton's law applies right to the center of mass, but the center of mass is a physical nonsense. And Leon Lamprecht made the point that uh, deep earthquakes down to 600 kilometers and below occur where the Earth's mantle should be like uh, treacle. 
and uh, not subject to shearing because the earthquake is supposed to be uh, rocks moving past one another, shearing, breaking. And he had some very good arguments why the, the, um, the, the earth should be hollow. And one of them was that the shadow region in the opposite hemisphere to a powerful earthquake, you have a, a powerful earthquake here and you get uh, signals which are curved up this way. So you get uh, echoes all around here. And then you have a, a blank spot and then they appear over here. And this has required all sorts of uh, fanciful objects inside to try and explain how on earth you get a signal through the so-called liquid core. So you have an outer core and an inner core and all of this kind of thing. The simplest answer, if you get rid of the inner and outer cores, um, is that you have a shell and the density increases as you go down and then it gets to a point where it decreases again. So there's some uh, area here, so, some point at some depth, where the density begins to reduce once more. And when you do that, this shadow region over here is very easily explained. It's, it falls out as a natural consequence. But the other aspect of all this is that we are unable to determine the amount of matter in a celestial body by measuring its gravity because it makes all of the Newtonian assumptions which are incorrect. The calculated densities are meaningless. And this is interesting too. Uh, the Apollo 12 mission was the first mission to have a seismometer. And they put it on the surface and then one of the orbiting uh, bits of spacecraft was uh, deliberately crashed into the moon uh, to see what kind of signal they would get and to try and determine the inner structure of the moon. Well, they were totally blown away and this, is, this uh, rang like a bell uh, description was uh, one that appeared in the uh, scientific journals at the time because the moon rang like a bell for an, almost an hour after the crash. And they said, it must be hollow. But of course, that was laughed off. It's always good to read the reports on, at the time of the event or shortly after before they've uh, figured out an excuse. And of course, Exhibit A is Comet 67P. Uh, it was the destination of the Rosetta mission and the comet looks like rock because it is rock. And it was just lucky that Philae's ice harpoons, which were designed to fire into ice and to clamp the uh, spacecraft to the uh, surface, failed the fire because they would have uh, <laughs> shot the uh, spacecraft back into space and it wouldn't have landed at all. Of course, using uh, Newton's gravity, it says it has a mean density of half a gram per cubic centimetre. But if the, matter, the amount of matter in the body, uh, or the mass, uh, is measured by this means, it's an energetic variable, so it depends on the electrical uh, polarisation of this object. And its electrical polarisation is obviously at odds with its surroundings because it has these electric jets. See how this is like uh, what Don Scott showed for the sun. See how this jet actually comes out and collimates beyond the surface, which is obviously a Birkeland current type effect. So the comets, coma and jets are electric discharge phenomena and there are little white spots uh, discovered in the close-ups on the surface uh, by the lander. Those bright spots uh, have no definition which would be typical of a plasma discharge. And this is interesting too because um, the gigantic an land animals in the past could not have uh, survived under present day gravity on the Earth. And uh, one fellow some years ago presented at one of our very early conferences and he'd worked out the um, bone and muscle strength required for some of these animals to lift themselves off the ground and he said they would have broken the bones in the attempt and they would have had to have been uh, fitter and stronger than the strongest man uh, weightlifter on earth. You know, the muscle and bone strength. Also these long necks, if you had a steel girder that long with that weight attached to it, it would bend under the weight. 
under present day gravity. When these uh, size animals were first uh, discovered, it was decided they must be waders so that the buoyancy would help uh, su support their weight. But then later they found footprints and some of them were running. Well, the, the largest land animal today is the elephant and its bone structure is such that the back acts like a Roman arch and the legs are more like pillars. Uh, these tended to be fleet-footed, even at the, these great sizes. So the Earth's gravity was about one-third of today's. This shows that the Earth can also undergo the same kind of uh, effects as the Comet 67P. Under different electrical environments, the mass of the Earth and its gravity will be different. So global extinction and instant fossilisation requires far more than a simple impact. Even the burial and fossilisation is not explained by an impact. Clearly, we have no understanding of Earth's real history. So future science is going to look so different. <laughs> Planets. This was a quote from a uh, planetary specialist. And he said, attempts to find a plausible naturalistic explanation of the origin of the solar system began about 350 years ago but have not yet been quantitatively successful, making this one of the oldest unsolved problems in modern science. So that was a, an admission a few years ago and nothing has changed. Astronomy's massive problem. Newtonian gravity is highly limiting to, in the standard model because all you have is attraction, collisions and explosions. The moon was not formed by a massive impact with the Earth. The moon was captured because capture is far more easy, but far more likely with electrogravity because they can transfer charge to one another that modifies their gravity and you have a means of reducing the kinetic energy of a passing body, modifying its orbit. We know that comets' orbits are, suffer so-called non-gravitational forces. It's, it's not non-gravitational, it's gravitational. It's just that the mass and the gravity of that object is changing in ways that are not uh, uh, available to uh, the, the theorists. So the collisions tend to be avoided. Is there a method to stabilise the chaotic nature of a Newtonian system? Because a Newtonian system with a single force, an attractive force, is not stable. Any departure from a stable configuration, there is nothing to get it to come back to stability. It will become chaotic. And Crucially, electric currents do flow between planets through their plasma tails. Each planet has its own cometary Birkeland current tail. Venus tickles the Earth at uh, conjunction, and Mars, we tickle Mars at opposition. But if the planets come much closer, you will get these, and the, um, the magnetospheres, as they call it, the plasma spheres, touch the two objects see each other electrically. The electrical shielding of the plasma breaks down and you have the possibility of these thunderbolts of the gods. And that transfer of charge is on such a scale that the orbits are changed dramatically. And the tendency is for the orbits to uh, move apart. The outer planet will move away and the inner planet will move in the opposite direction towards the sun. In this case, if the mass doubles, the orbital radius must double to conserve orbital energy. Changing surface charge will modify the masses of both planets and move their orbits apart. It, it changes the polarisation, the electrical polarisation inside these bodies. And this stabilising effect is lacking in celestial mechanics. Uh, back to electric stars for a moment. Um, I mentioned that the other day. They remain a focus of uh, galactic electrical discharge. All stars have cool planetary cores. Now, when I did this, I hadn't figured out electrogravity, so I need to redo it and make that a shell. <laughs> All bright stars catalytically produce heavy elements in their photospheric plasma discharges, and I think the SAPPHIRE experiment is um, uh, redeeming that uh, outrageous possibility. But this is interesting. 
uh, in dealing with the work of David Talbot and uh, Dwight Cardona in particular, who was trying to piece together the very earliest information we had about the situation of the Earth and its environment in the past, everything fits with the idea that we were a part of a planetary system orbiting inside a plasma sheath, which is what uh, all red stars have. They don't have a bright photosphere. They have a, uh, an anode glow which expands in space to satisfy the environment. As we've seen uh, with the Sapphire project, you twiddle the knobs and the, these uh, double layers move out from the, um, uh, the central object, the star. Now, it's been known uh, by astronomers that some of these red giants, for instance, uh, Betelgeuse, if it was in our solar system, its uh, red sheath would stretch out beyond the orbit of Mars, almost to Jupiter. That means that the uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars would all be orbiting inside that star. And because the plasma there is uh, very diffuse, it wouldn't cause any difficulties. But the really important uh, point is that this glowing shell will uh, heat and light every square metre of every body in that uh, system equally. There will be no uh, seasons. Um, and also, the, these kinds of stars have uh, show water and other elements that are required for uh, life in their spectrum. So I would say that uh, these red bodies are the cradle of life in the universe. The radiant energy received from a glowing plasma envelope is constant over the entire globe. It's independent of orbit, rotation and axial inclination, so there are no seasons. And red light promotes photosynthesis. When you think about the Carboniferous era, the Earth was covered with huge forests, even in the uh, Antarctic and Arctic. And they found dinosaur fossils in the Antarctic as well. And water molecules dominate the spectra of brown dwarfs, which could explain the abundant water on Earth. The only uh, explanation the astronomers have come up with is that uh, comets delivered water to the Earth way back when, you know, once upon a time. Uh, but every uh, comet they visited has shown to be lack water, you know. So that uh, theory isn't much, much good. It never was. However, these bodies are shed matter in an attempt to maintain stability so that all of the uh, orbiting uh, planets and smaller objects will be receiving the materials they need for uh, life, the water, the atmosphere, and occasionally, unfortunately, these stars also eject uh, solid, or at least dust and rocks and other things from their uh, own material, which means that you get layering of these bodies. And every object that's been uh, looked up looked at closely, including the moon, has layering. Even Comet 67P had stratified uh, layers. So all of the objects in here sort of um, develop in time with material dumped upon them. It would explain many things about the Earth's past, including the great dyings, the ends of those geological eras where most of the life on Earth was wiped out, because uh, the scientists looking at these red dwarfs have been surprised by the violence of their outbursts sometimes. As one astronomer said, the people close to that brown dwarf would have been having a very bad day. Well, we've had some very bad days, it seems, under those circumstances. However, the, cer the conditions there are very conducive to life. So searching for ET is not going to work too well because uh, you cannot send radio waves through that plasma shell. <laughs> so any people living on such worlds would most likely be unaware of the universe at large. 
However, as I say, if uh, you fail using radio waves, uh, galactic communication may be possible at the speed of thought, which is in, you know, instantaneous. This fellow here is a mythographer, Dr. David Avery. And he said, uh, all human societies are based on a mythology and the study of mythologies is called mythography. And he wrote, wrote this on his website. Story is how humans create meaning. It forms a web of perception that links the things we see into a pattern which makes sense to our minds. Without story, our world is just a random series of unconnected events. And he came across the Electric Universe and made a short YouTube video, which you can actually find if you Google his name. Uh, and he said, there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. The Electric Universe is more than just another scientific theory. It's the key to a whole new age of humanity. And you can understand why, and, and I feel strongly about this, that this is a connecting and explanatory cosmology. And we can see our real place in the universe and feel connected to a conscious universe, not a dead, uh, meaningless universe. It's an idea that will quite literally change the world, and I think we're due for it. <laughs> Electric universe cosmology is, is the key we've been waiting for. So thank you, David. Here's another uh, fellow, Na Nicholas Maxwell, a philosopher of science and emeritus reader at the University College London. And he says, how can we understand our human world embedded as it is within the physical universe in such a way that justice is done both to the richness meaning and value of human life on the one hand and to what modern science tells us about the physical universe on the other hand. At present, our modern cosmology is uh, pathetic. It's hopeless. Hopeless. Big Bang cosmology has nothing to offer. Our real history. Now, the Australian Aborigines have some wonderful uh, rock art and stories, and the elders still remember the meaning of, at least they have some of the instructions uh, very clear, much clearer than a lot of the uh, things that have come down through the more so-called advanced civilizations in the past. So we need to pay attention to them and also uh, honour them, really. It's dreadful what we, how we've treated them. And they saw the landforms that they, they uh, cherish uh, being created in front of their eyes. And uh, it was all due to the rainbow serpent of the sky. This little book here is fascinating. When the snake bites the sun, the plasma uh, imagery and references in this are quite remarkable. Of course, it's not recognised as such, but when you uh, understand the behaviour of plasma, and this snake in the sky is a, uh, an archetypal comet. And there were two suns, a greater and a lesser sun. What on earth were they talking about? When you're dealing with this kind of thing, and this is what David Talbot and the um, uh, comparative mythologist did, was to accept best evidence regardless of its fit with modern consensus science and man-made laws. You had to approach it with a beginner's mind. You then use that evidence to develop a more holistic science, which is what I recognised early on. And also you realise then that this is no uh, geological effect, it's not a tectonic effect. Uh, it has the obvious... In fact, I, d I finally figured out, I was trying to determine what exactly this scar represented and then NASA published a picture which showed that this is the centre of a, a barred spiral galaxy. This is the uh, bar in the spiral and the arm comes down here and the scarring extends all the way around here. So this is your spiral arm here. This side, it curves upwards and the scarring is different as if the current flow was uh, a different polarity. Same as the north and south, there's a difference in the scarring but all of this is electrical. Well, you can tell the channels, the sub-channels, the tributaries, they cross one another like you know, train tracks. There's no deposit from one in the other, and they come in orthogonally. Now, high-energy discharges 
have coronal discharges which come from the main channel at right angles. So when you look at the so-called water or methane lakes and channels on Titan, just have a look at the channels. They'll have orthogonally arranged tributaries. So planets bear obvious electrical scars of past encounters on their faces. Once again, I have my <laughs> commercial gravity is not understood. We may now, though, begin to understand our history and connection to the electric universe for the first time once we get that history straight. Myth becomes science rather than science becoming a myth. This is the vivid display in Sydney uh, a couple of years ago, and they projected these Wanjina figures, they're called, from the Kimberleys uh, way up in the northwest of Australia. They are haunting figures, and of course, modern man doesn't know what they mean. But I do have that book that was, uh, I showed the cover of in the last slide, which was Yoro Yoro, All Things Standing Up. And the uh, Aboriginal elder who told the story said, these figures, uh, they never have a mouth, they have no ears. This, the, the headdress is lightning surrounding. These are not eyes. This is a... Uh, it's not a nose. In fact, the one that was on the cover has a hollow. It's a hollow tube. It's a plasma tube. And it, they, the words used, and he, had, he said, you've got to be very specific in the use of the words. This represents the power flowing down. What on earth are they talking about? They're talking about an electrical event which uh, created the landscape on the earth. The power came down from above. You, you realise all these weird figures, they're not people, they're a representation of plasma phenomenon which was spectacular and also dreadful. I went into the uh, New South Wales gallery and um, we, with a friend of mine who has been studying Aboriginal art for some years and he took me down there and he said to me, you notice how the Aboriginals often do, it's not shown here, but they do very fine work, usually cross hatches, you know, tiny thin lines. And he said, you know why they do that? It's so that it shimmers. Shimmers like water. And that was the references to the waters above, the waters in the heaven, it, because the plasma, uh, the uh, plasma toroids had this shimmering effect as, as though they were... Uh, water. Anyway, enough of that. There's a whole, I mean, you could spend a whole day just talking about these things. <laughs> I think the longest I've stood on my feet talking about the electric universe was six hours and they almost had to carry me off the stage. <laughs> Stonehenge Decoded. This comes from Tony Peratt's work and was published in uh, a journal put out by the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the aspects of these columns, the cylindrical columns, is that uh, beyond a certain distance, uh, electrons and so on will form filaments. It, f it forms filaments, but in characteristic numbers. And 56 is one of those characteristic numbers. And so when Tony uh, looked at... We actually visited Stonehenge with Tony and other <coughs> members of the SIS and, and that uh, some few years back. And... Uh, when he went, the, uh, this is the Aubrey holes here. There's 56 of them, this pattern. In that same article, um, Tony uh, compared a radiating system of lines with, from Australia with those of the North American Indians. And when he changed the uh, aspect according to the latitude and longitude, the two matched perfectly, the same number of lines and uh, same orientation. So what was seen was obviously in the heavens and it was overwhelming. The electric universe, of course, has to say something about life and consciousness and existence and all of these kinds of things and it connects with all of those people who are doing natural therapies and uh, you know, dowsing and all those kinds of things because once you realise that everything is connected and it's connected in a resonant way, which means that information can be transferred. 
even, between, even at the level of crystals or water. And you can understand how homeopathy has a mechanism. It means that the electric universe doesn't have any taboos regarding these subjects and that uh, people in future should be funded to actually devise experiments with that physical model in mind. Once you've got a physical model in mind, it's like uh, with Monty and uh, Sapphire, you can then think about how you would uh, devise an experiment to test. So I think this is very important for the future. Of course, in the biological realm, the just maintaining coherence amongst the trillions of uh, complex uh, movements and chemical reactions that are taking place at any given instant, that cannot work unless the entire body is involved and knows exactly what's going on throughout the body. It raises all sorts of interesting questions about intention. How, to what extent, uh, where does intention come from? And nothing can really manifest without intention. And it's amazing, once you realise this connectedness, that you can actually th uh, feel that you can influence things beyond yourself. It opens up all sorts of possibilities. So it's at the heart of being, consciousness, memory, morphic resonance, <laughs> all of these uh, things which at present, I mean, uh, Rupert Sheldrake's book, with, as Maddox said, was uh, only fit for burning. Well, <laughs> I think he got that wrong. I could have suggested something else burning. And the present taboos of science restrain this understanding. Just imagine the blossoming of uh, research and uh, science if we could allow this to become mainstream. Instead, right now, politically, it's being suppressed quite powerfully. People are uh, actually, it's costing people uh, their livelihood in some cases. The future. Professor Roger, Roger Westcott uh, became a very good friend. He was uh, around in the very early days of uh, the Electric Universe and used to come to our meetings. Uh, he was um, an educationist, really, and, and we discussed all the problems with education. But his view was that whatever happened in the past was so traumatic that we still behave like some... Uh, as the whole of humanity behaves as if we're suffering amnesia. Subconsciously, we recognise the truth behind uh, the fact that we went through the end of the world. We thought everything was finished and we've never healed from it. And uh, it's been said that the only way to heal from such an event, a, a, an event that you do not want to uh, think about, is to have it explained to you gradually you um, gradually take on the reality of what happened and come to terms with it. That's the only way to heal. But instead of that, we go through this cycle, like post-traumatic stress disorder, where we um, revert to trying to destroy the world ourselves. Because that's what happens. You try and either visit the, uh, the terrible event on somebody else or live it vicariously, go to horror movies or the end of the world type movies, and there are plenty of them now. And you realise that what we're doing is trying to relive something that we don't want to remember, but we feel we have to. That David Avery made a YouTube video, and I took this from it because I think it's pretty apt, given the state of things at the present. Bronze Age man is still running the world. We have not got out of post-traumatic stress disorder. And Roger said, man is a wounded animal. His survival is astonishing. And it is astonishing. But his inability to heal his wounds is tragic. One of the great things about sharing uh, the state of knowledge about the electric universe, and this is a, obviously a never-ending um, adventure, is we draw in people who have specific interests and the leaders pop up and this is exactly what we need if we're going to have a paradigm shift. 
we have to encourage people to stand up and say, I want to take over this aspect of you know, the task ahead. Chris Reeve is doing an amazing job. What he's doing is looking at controversies of science. And he points out, imagine for a moment what it would be like if nobody ever critiqued and dissected the most profound pieces of literature in our society and realised that this is what people do every single day in science. Academia has refused to track challenges to their own preferred theories. This lack of exposure to critique leaves the false impression that the current theories are in good shape. If we were culturally on the verge of an impending paradigm change, how would we know? One thing's certain, the experts will be the last to know. You people are the first. <laughs> a critical review of the history of science journalism shows that modern science journalism obscures our ability to see them coming. Uh, I showed that short clip of Brian Cox, which uh, shows that in spades. And Chris says, for me, the electric universe is one of the few real thought-provoking things happening in the world. And I've been very pleased to get feedback from this wonderful audience, and it's all of this nature. That the theory is, it's inspiring, and this is what we need. We need to inspire people, that, everyone. It, it's, this is open to everyone. And I'm always happy to uh, get ideas from people and see if we can fit it into that big puzzle. The electric universe, one force to rule them all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.